The Lord be with you. Welcome to worship on this fifth Sunday of Lent. We begin Holy Week next week. If you're visiting with us this morning, we extend a warm welcome to you. We're an open, vibrant, inclusive congregation. We welcome all people of goodwill. If you'd like to become a part of our church family, we'd love to have you. Today's flowers are given to the glory of God and in loving memory of George Patrick by the Patrick family. At 1010 this morning, we have two adult classes. Bob Cox will lead a class entitled, Who is Jesus in the Gospel of Mark? His class will be downstairs in classroom six. The other class will be taught by our special uh, guest this morning, Adams Kasinga, the founder and CEO of Congo, or Conserve Congo. Mr. Mr. Kasinga, welcome. He recently spoke at the UN on the importance of conserving the biodiversity of the Democratic Republic of Congo. He'll be speaking this morning down in Walton Community Hall at 1010. We have two weekly Bible studies. They are on Zoom, one Wednesdays at noon, the other Thursdays at six. Our Peace and Justice education event this week is learn how a small working group encourages elected officials and public leaders to speak out against hate. There's more information about that class on page six. Of course, that's at seven o'clock and it's on Zoom. As I said, Holy Week begins next Sunday and the schedule you'll find on page seven. Right now, Teresa Wimhoff will present a minute for mission for us. She will tell us about an exciting new program for our children. Good morning. Have you ever wished you had just a fraction of the energy that abounds while watching children running around playing? We have. Have you ever wished there were more opportunities for the children in your life to participate in the inspiring outreach work of Westminster? Are you involved in the mission work of the church and yearning for fresh energy and enthusiasm to infuse your group's work. Well, we, Care Francis and I, have a great opportunity for all of you. The newly forming Youth Service Corps is busy planning service learning activities to connect our kids with our mission, outreach, and justice initiatives. The Youth Service Corps is enthusiastically supported by our joint mission committees and was recently unanimously approved by session. We anticipate one to two pilot projects this spring with the goal of a full rollout for school year 24-25. We'll be starting with our K to five age group with the hope of expanding in the future. Parents with kindergarten through fifth grade students, please save the date, April 14th, at 11.15 a.m., immediately following Kid Zone. We will have lunch, then head to St. Stephen's Food Pantry to learn about their work and participate in packing supplemental food bags for families. What was that date? Thank you. <laughs> Even if you can't make it to church that day, please join us for the event. You're welcome to bring a friend. Keep your eye out for an email and a flyer coming home today. We will need a liaison from each of our existing outreach groups to help with planning events. If you have an idea for a project, we'd love to hear from you. We want to instill a practice of service while teaching compassion and having fun alongside peers. We can't wait to see what the Holy Spirit, working through our creative and talented congregation, has in store for all of us. Sounds like an exciting new program for our youth and our children to uh, extend the welcome and the love of God to others. Let's stand and share the peace of Christ with one another.
We gather in awe before the source of all things. Powerful presence above us, below us, within us, and around us. join together in our call to confession. We are created in God's image, but sin distorts our essential nature. Joining our voices together and praying, merciful God, who would have us give thanks for all things and fear nothing but the loss of your presence we confess our faithless fears and our worldly anxieties. We have done those things we ought not to have done and left undone those things we ought to have done. Grant us true repentance, forgive our sins, and give us the will to put away all that is harmful to ourselves and others. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. And in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. I'd like for the children to come forward and join me up front now. You beat me. Way to go. You're moving. Hi, Caden. Hi there, lighting up shoes. Yeah, good, good. Okay, I brought some things with me this morning, and I would like for you to name them as I bring them out. Who knows what this is? What is it? It's a broom, that's right. Okay, and what about this? What's that? It's a scrubber. A scrub brush, right, right, good. And one more thing, well, a couple of things here. Any idea what this is? 
A glass cleaner, right. This is what we use to clean the windows and we use the cloth to wipe them. So, now, I want you to um, think about this. When we clean our house, we obviously use these sorts of things. And I want you to pretend now that you're cleaning. So, like everybody, stand up out here. And I want you to show me how you would clean if you had a broom in your hand. Show me. Okay? Hop down, hop down, there we go. Pretend you're using a broom. How to use it? Clean, clean, come on, come on. We gotta get this floor clean. There, that's better. Okay, good. Now, how about a scrub brush? What would you do with it? Oh, good, good. Down on your knees, right? Scrubbing on the floor. Good, good, very good. Ah, yes, very good. You know you need a scrub brush when you walk into your kitchen and your feet stick to the floor. <laughs> and oh, oh, one more thing, one more thing. Gotta show me. Show me. How would you use this to clean glass, you know? We, you squirt it on, right, 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 and then with a cloth, good, good, you'd wipe it all clean. Okay, good, very good. I think um, I might have some of you come over to my house and do a little cleaning. Yeah. That sounds like a lot of fun, right? Yeah, yeah, maybe tomorrow? Well, we'll see. Okay, well, cleaning our house reminded me that sometimes we need to clean up our lives but brooms and scrub brushes and window cleaner, those aren't going to help us very much to clean up our lives, are you? So, when is it that we need to clean up our lives? Can you think of that? It's kind of a hard question. How about when we've done something wrong, right? If you've not told the truth, we need to say, we're sorry, and we promise to do better. That would help clean up our lives. If we've not shared with someone when we're playing with them, we need to apologize and say, next time I'm going to share. Or if we called somebody a bad name, we definitely need to say, oh, I'm not gonna do that anymore. I'm really sorry I did that. Now, every single person in this sanctuary and every single person in the world has times when we need to clean up our lives. We can start by saying we're sorry and then promising that we'll do better in the future. Let's have a prayer. Everybody join in. Dear God, when we make a mistake, we will admit it and we will promise to do better. Amen. Great. Thank you for coming up this morning. You guys did a good job cleaning. Good to see you, Katie. This morning's scripture lesson comes from a very familiar passage. It comes from the Genesis story. I'm going to start in chapter 2, and then we're going to jump over to 3 because it's just so long to read all of that together. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may freely eat of any tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of that tree, you will die. Now jumping over to chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other animal that God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you will die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat, your eyes will be opened 
and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said, Where are you? The man said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. Because I was naked, I hid myself. God said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit of the tree. (laughs) Then the Lord said to the woman, What is that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Author Frank McCourt had a stint teaching English in a tough, blue-collar high school in Staten Island. Without fail, each time he gave a writing assignment, several students wouldn't complete the homework on time. However, on the day that the paper was due, the students wouldn't show up empty-handed. They would bring a note explaining the reason for them not completing the assignment. The notes were supposedly from a parent, but were obviously forgeries. He held on to the notes because they were always so well written. In fact, better than the other writing the students normally did. He writes, if their parents could read these excuse notes, they would discover that their kids are capable of the finest American prose, clear, dramatic, persuasive, and especially imaginative. (laughs) Here are a few of the excuses he collected. The stove caught fire and the wallpaper went up in flames and the fire department kept us out of the house all night. Don't you just hate it when that happens? (laughs) Arnold doesn't have his work today because he was getting off the train yesterday and the door closed on his school bag and the train took it away. He yelled to the conductor, who said very vulgar things as the train drove away. Something should be done. Here's a beauty. I love this one. A man died in the bathtub upstairs, and it overflowed and dripped through the ceiling and ruined Roberta's homework that was on the kitchen table. I mean, you can't argue with that, right? Last one. We were evicted from our apartment, and the mean sheriff said if my son kept yelling for his notebook, he'd have us all arrested. (laughs) McCourt reflects, isn't it remarkable how they resist any writing assignment? They whine, they say they're too busy, they can't put 200 words together on any subject. But I have a drawer full of excuse notes that could be turned into an anthology of the great American excuses. Now, as he pondered how skillful they were at concocting excuses, an idea struck. The next day, as the students came in, he wrote on the board, write an excuse note from Adam to God or from Eve to God. He told his students that they could start the essay in class and finish it at home. He said, heads went down, 
pins raced across the paper. They could do this with one hand tied behind their backs. The bell rang, and for the first time in three and a half years, he saw high school students so immersed in what they were writing that friends had to coax them out of the room to go eat lunch. Now, the assignment elicited the most imaginative and expressive writing he'd ever seen. The students came up with brilliant excuses for Adam and Eve. Well, as is apparent from today's scripture reading, from the very beginning, humans have cooked up excuses to explain their errant behavior. God confronts Abraham, or Adam in the garden. Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? God's looking for a simple yes or no. But Adam replies, oh, that woman you gave me, she's the one who gave me the fruit and I ate of it. It's all her fault, or, or possibly even God's fault for creating Eve in the first place. So God turns to Eve and says, what is this that you've done? And she replies, ah, it was the serpent that tricked me. Now, of course, this isn't really the story of the first humans. It's about all humans. Since the dawn of the human race, whenever people have been called to account, they have displaced this remarkable ability to concoct excuses. Perhaps you know someone who has difficulty accepting responsibility for his actions. No doubt this doesn't apply to anyone sitting here because all of us, we, we have solid justifications for the reasons that we, our behavior sometimes out of bounds. Although I wonder if God is collecting our rationalizations and preparing to publish the best alibis ever. I hope God gets an occasional chuckle from our imaginative excuses because God likely despairs over our reticence to own up to our failures. Now, it's imperative that we engrave on our foreheads image of God before venturing into today's story. It's a symbolic story. It's a very profound story of how the first human beings barely have their feet on the ground in this breathtaking garden God has provided, think Longwood Gardens times 10, when they are thrown out and the gate is slammed behind them. Adam and Eve had it made. They had each other. They had a garden paradise. They had meaningful work to care for the garden. They were surrounded by all these trees that were pleasing to sight and just filled with ripe fruit. God announced that they could munch on the fruit from every tree in the garden, except one. They were not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, what typically happens to us when we are told, you can have all of this, but you just can't have this. A voice whispers in our head, why can't we have that? And a force lures us to crave the one thing that is marked forbidden. In the creation story, the serpent serves as the shadow voice that entices us to do what God has warned us not to do. The serpent tells Eve that if she'll eat from that tree, nothing negative is going to happen. Rather, it will open your eyes, the serpent says, and you'll be like God. Don't you want to be the master of your destiny? God creates the world and everything in it, including humans, and says it is very good. People are created in God's image. We're even told that humans are just a little lower than God. Further, our Creator knows that life would be meaningless if we were unable to act 
and choose. So God gives us freedom. It is the enormous risk that God takes. If we choose well and live as God wants us to live, well, wow, life can be paradise. However, if we place ourselves in the role of God, rejecting divine wisdom and deciding for ourselves what's good and what's evil, then all hell can break loose. If we give in to lust, trust is destroyed. Gluttony, we self-destruct. Envy, we shatter our relationships. Anger, we abuse and oppress. Greed, the natural world gets polluted. Neglect, people who are hungry may starve. The Lenten season, the 40 days leading up to Easter, is to be a time of personal introspection. A time to wrestle with our faith by asking questions. Tough questions. We are to wade through all of our personal justifications that lead to dubious thoughts and actions, and we're to strive to have a very honest conversation with ourselves. Lent's not a time to tiptoe around your personal demons. It's a time to confront them, knowing that you can conquer them. Lent is not a time to batter our egos, nor a time for false humility. God, I'm such a mess, there's just no hope for me. Lent is not a time to grovel and despair. Rather, it's a challenge to look into the mirror and have a direct discourse with ourselves about the ways we've missed the mark. However, it's never a time to blot out the essential fact that you are a child of God created in God's image. Lent is a reminder that we will never experience the joy God intends nor become the full, thriving human being we are meant to become if we ignore the dark thoughts, and actions that sometimes lure us away from what is right and true and good. Now, some avoid self-examination because they know that there are parts of their character that are far from noble, and they just want to try to avoid any feelings of guilt. But in light of God's grace... Coming clean is the first step in our challenge to become healthy and robust. Sin can never be reduced to a simple checklist because it's larger than that. In both the Hebrew and the Greek, the root word for sin means missing the mark. Instead of being spot on, we're off target. Sin ruptures relationships. It torpedoes our ties with each other, and it alienates us from God. Now, it doesn't separate us from God. Nothing in all creation can separate us from God. But it drags us out of sync with God. Episcopal priest and professor Barbara Brown Taylor says, Sin is a name for the experience of being cut off from air, light, community, hope, meaning. There are a thousand ways to turn away from the light. The point is to know the difference between light and darkness and to recognize the pull of darkness when it comes. 
Many Sundays, we include a prayer of confession in our worship service. Its purpose is not to whittle away at our self-esteem. God does not confess us, call on us to confess our sin in order to obliterate our ego. Rather, confession is a way of overcoming denial and opening ourselves to God's forgiveness. But forgiveness is not the omega point. God does not forgive us simply to wipe away our guilt. God forgives in order to transform. Forgiveness opens a door that allows the divine image that's at our core to blossom. If we make excuses and refuse to admit what is wrong with us, we remain stuck where we are because we block God's power to transform us. That's why confession should never be approached with despair, but rather with hope. God forgives so that we can become free. Free to live the beautiful and abundant life God intends for us to live. And free to become partners with God in nudging our world just a little closer to paradise.
God gives. God gives life and breath and so much in our creation. We express our thanks with our morning gifts. In February, we ordained and installed a number of people as elders and deacons in the church. Three were unable to be here at that time, and so this morning we ordain and install three women onto the board of deacons. Now, each of us is called into the church by baptism. We're marked as one of God's own. All of us are called to be faithful followers who serve Christ with a humble and loving spirit. Yet some are called to ordained offices. Right now I call on Jan Patrick, the clerk of the session, to read the names of the deacons to be ordained and installed. And I'd like for you to come forward as your name is read. The following members are to be ordained and installed as deacons. Susan Badorf, Barbara Welsh, and Linda Williams.
women have been recognized as possessing special gifts for ministry. And by ordaining and installing them, we authorize them to use their gifts as leaders in our church. We will now ask them the ordination and installation questions from the Book of Order of the Presbyterian Church, USA. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge Him Lord of all and Head of the Church, and through Him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the Church Universal and God's Word to you? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and accept the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you and will you? I do and I will. Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ? under the authority of Scripture, and be continually guided by our confessions. Will you? I will. Will you be governed by our church's polity, and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's Word and Spirit? Will you? Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? I do. Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love, will you? Will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? In your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ, will you? Do we, the members of Westminster, accept these women as deacons chosen by God through the voice of our congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? Do we? We And do we agree to pray for them, to encourage them, to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? Do we? Let us pray. God of love and compassion, you poured out your life in service through your Son, Jesus Christ. By word and example, he taught us to find fulfillment in giving ourselves and greatness in serving others. Bless those called to be deacons who lead us in the service and caring. Empower them by the grace of your Spirit, that your whole church may give its life for the sake of the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve. In God's holy name we pray. Amen. All right, please rise. You are now deacons in the Presbyterian Church USA and for this congregation. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it in the name and in the love of Jesus Christ. Welcome to the Board of Deacons. Welcome to the Board of Deacons, Susan. Barbara, welcome back. Thank you. Thanks, Jan.
And now may love, joy, peace, and hope be yours this day and forever. Amen.